I'm not sufficiently uh, loud. Uh, I'm going to put in a little, a little plug for the seminar on comparative constitutional design, which is offered in the, in the fall, if anyone is in interested in these issues or becomes interested as, as a result of this talk. Um, apart from that, however, it's a great pleasure to, uh, uh, to welcome Professor Williams to Duke. Um, Professor Williams um, got her uh, undergraduate law degrees from Harvard. Uh, she was a law clerk to uh, judge, not justice, but judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that is before Ju Justice Ginsburg uh, became uh, an associate justice of the Supreme Court when she was uh, a judge on the D.C. Circuit. Um, she, uh, uh, Professor Williams, uh, before she went to Indiana, taught at Cornell Law School, uh, and at Indiana uh, she is um, the Associate Director of the Center for Constitutional Democracy in Plural Societies. That center uh, is uh, both studying and promoting democracy uh, in several uh, ethnically divided societies. Most of its work to this point has been concentrated on Burma and Liberia, and that's what Professor Williams is going to speak on today. Um, I should tell you a little bit about the center, although I'm sure she's going to tell you more about it. The center is, is uh, both interested in learning uh, and in applying uh, what it's learned about uh, constitution making uh, in divided societies. Uh, and it, um, it, it holds some conferences, it uh, does some training, and it does consulting uh, in various countries. Well, I'm not going to uh, occupy the time here talking about what Professor Williams is going to tell you about, so uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce and to welcome Professor Susan Williams. Thank you. Can you hear me at this level? Yes? Good. Thank you for inviting me to your lovely campus, uh, and thank you especially to Professors Horowitz and Bradley um, for this invitation. Uh, when I left Indiana yesterday, it was snowing. So although this may feel cold to you, it feels like spring to me. Um, let me begin by apologizing. Uh, you were expecting two people, I believe, and you have only one. Um, due to a combination of babysitter cancellation and illness in my family, um, my husband David was not able to join us today, and he sends his regrets. Uh, what I'm going to offer you today is more of a narrative than an argument. It's the story of the unfolding constitutional process in Burma and Liberia, and of our center's involvement in that process. And it will, of necessity, be a broad survey of a large landscape of constitutionalism. I hope that we'll be able to examine particular features of that landscape in more detail in the discussion after I speak. So first, uh, as Professor Horowitz anticipated I would do, let me tell you a little about our center. The purpose of the center is to provide education and advice to democratic reformers seeking constitutional ways to deal with ethnic, religious, racial, linguistic, or other divisions in their societies. All societies have such divisions, of course, but in many countries these are the fault lines that constantly imperil democracy. And while which particular divisions matter, varies widely between societies, there are some commonalities as well. For example, one way in which every society is plural is that they all include more than one gender. In advising democratic reformers, the center draws on the resources of the university in a wide range of disciplines and area studies. We also have fellows at IU who come from the countries with which we work. The fellows are studying law as LLM or SJD students, but they're also actively engaged in the work of the center as translators, as teachers, and as members of the constitutional drafting teams. The model for our work is very much the lawyer-client relationship. We understand ourselves as educating the drafters about the constitutional possibilities, 
helping them to formulate their own goals, and working with them to design a constitutional text that will best promote those goals. We see this as a long-term commitment to a particular country, and we understand the constitutional process to extend beyond the drafting and ratification of the Constitution and include the statutory and administrative mechanisms that will be necessary to make the constitutional order effective. So we expect to be working with our partners for many years to come. The two countries with which we have the most established relationship are Burma and Liberia. And I'm going to start my story with Burma because our center's work began with Burma, and Burma is still at the heart of our work in all senses. Burma is a country of about 55 million people. It borders India and Bangladesh on the west, and China, Laos, and Thailand on the east. Burma was a British colony until 1948, when it achieved independence. It experienced a brief and turbulent period of democracy, during which there arose armed resistance, both from communist groups and from ethnic minority groups. In 1962, the military took control of the government, and it has been ruling Burma ever since. Burma has a very complex ethnic mix. The majority ethnic group, the Burmans, make up somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the population. They live predominantly in the central plains of Burma, they speak Burmese, and they are overwhelmingly Buddhist. The military rulers of Burma come from this ethnic majority group. The remaining 40 percent roughly, of the population, is made up of seven major ethnic minority groups, the Shan, the Karen, the Kareni, the Arakan, the Mun, the Chin, and the Kachin. There are a multitude of smaller ethnic groups as well, and there are also a substantial number of people of Chinese or Indian ancestry living in Burma today. The ethnic minority groups have their own regional homelands, they have their own languages, and they have cultures that differ substantially from the majority Burman culture. In particular, several of the ethnic minority groups are Christian, Muslim, or animist rather than Buddhist. And there is an ancient history of enmity between many of these groups and the Burmans. The, major the military government, excuse me, after 1962 was a disaster for Burma, not only in terms of civil rights, but also in terms of material conditions. Burma is a country rich in natural resources. They have natural gas, they have timber, they have gemstones, and more. It was once called the rice bowl of Asia, but now it's one of the poorest countries in the world. It has massive inflation, a crumbling infrastructure, and a population that cannot feed itself, let alone export rice to other countries. Now, part of the reason for this economic suffering is the enormous diversion of resources to the army. The army is estimated to be at least 400,000 soldiers. Many of them are child soldiers, according to the Human Rights Watch. Part of the cause for the economic deterioration is rampant corruption by government officials. And part of the cause is the irrationality of the military leaders who engage periodically in totally arbitrary acts that cripple the economy. Uh, just to give you a rather dramatic example, uh, on more than one occasion, the government has demonetarized certain denominations of currency um, because their astrologers told the generals that those numbers were unlucky for them. The contemporary democracy movement dates from 1988, when there were large-scale public uprisings in Burma. The military junta killed many civilians in the course of these uprisings, but it did finally respond to them by allowing multi-party elections. The elections were held in 1990, and they were won overwhelmingly by the National League for Democracy, the NLD, which is the party headed by Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of General Aung San. General Aung San is regarded by many Burmese as the hero of their movement for independence from the British. The military government, which was apparently very surprised by the result of the election, never allowed the elected legislators to take their seats. Some of them were killed, some of them were jailed, and many fled the country and are now living in exile. Aung San Suu Kyi is presently under house arrest in Rangoon, where she has been for most of the period from 1989 till the present. <laughs> 
Now, international news coverage of Burma might lead you to believe that the issue is simply democracy versus tyranny. But in fact, it's not so simple. The military government is indeed repressive to all Burmese, but not equally so. All Burmese suffer from the material deprivation caused by the government and from political repression and the violation of basic civil rights. That's common to all the groups. But the military junta has used the ethnic divisions as a basis for special oppression directed at ethnic minority groups. There is both official and unofficial discrimination against ethnic minority groups and non-Buddhists in all spheres of life, in education, in business, and in the military. The government has an official policy of what's called Burmanization, which insists that all people in Burma will have one language, one religion, and one culture. And the military government regularly engages in massive human rights violations against the ethnic minority groups, including the killing of civilians, forced labor, rape, torture, forced relocations, the burning of villages, and the planting of landmines. Indeed, since January of 2006, the military has been involved in the systematic destruction of Karen State and its people with astonishingly little attention from the rest of the world. As a result of this war against its own civilians, the Burmese army has created a population of internally displaced persons estimated to be at least half a million people, and a population of external refugees of at least that many, probably several times that many, some in camps in Thailand and others scattered around the world. Uh, let me say a quick word about terminology. I call the country Burma rather than Myanmar um, because Burma is the name used by the democracy movement. Myanmar was a name that was adopted by the military government and it's powerfully associated with the Burman ethnic majority. The democracy movement has rejected this name both because of its association with the military and because of its overtones of ethnic oppression. Let me tell you a little about the legal regime here. Burma has had two constitutions. One was ratified in 1947, and one was imposed by the military government in 1974. The military government, which now calls itself the State Peace and Development Council, the SPDC, suspended the 1974 constitution in the aftermath of the public protests in 1988. So there has been no constitution in force in Burma since 1988. The SPDC has convened a constitutional convention to draft a new constitution, and that constitution has been meeting sporadically since 1993. But, first of all, that convention does not include participation by the democracy groups. Second, it is completely dominated by the military government, which has set conditions for the new constitution. For example, that it must assure at least one third of the legislative seats to the armed forces. Um, and it has not, in fact, resulted in a draft constitution. Despite having silenced their opponents, um, they haven't actually been able to produce a constitution yet. All right, so at the moment, Burma has no constitution in force. How are we, the center, involved in all of this? We got involved in Burma when an SJD student at our law school, who is himself a Burmese refugee, asked us to advise the Chin State Constitution Drafting Committee. Believe it or not, Indiana has one of the largest concentrations of Burmese people in the US, um, and particularly the Chins. After we met with that committee in Bloomington, the Ethnic Nationalities Council, which is the umbrella group for all of the different ethnic minority democracy organizations. The Ethnic Nationalities Council invited us to speak at the seminar that they hold every year for all of the state constitution drafting committees. So we traveled to Thailand and we met with a group of state constitutional drafters several times and also to India to meet with community leaders in the refugee communities there. Now, as you can imagine, in light of the brief history I've described, there is a great debt of trust between the majority and minority ethnic groups. And this has been a barrier to the unification of the democratic opposition 
Part of what we focused on in the seminars for state constitution drafters was the question whether some sort of federal structure with guarantees for minority representation and rights could provide a framework for a democratic Burma which all groups could embrace. Then, in February of 2005, there was a major breakthrough. All of the major democracy organizations from every ethnic group, including the government in exile, including women's groups and youth groups, they all agreed to empower a committee to work on drafting a federal constitution. They agreed to eight basic principles to guide the committee. And those principles are, first, sovereignty of the people, second, equality, third, self-determination, fourth, federalism, fifth, minority rights, sixth, a secular state, seventh, a multi-party democratic system, and eighth, human rights and gender equality. The committee, the drafting committee, was composed of people from all of the major ethnic groups, and it included members who also served on the state constitution drafting committees. And we were asked to serve as the technical advisory team for the drafting of the federal constitution. We met with the committee in Thailand in 2005 to go over their first draft. And that draft was brought back to all of the authorizing groups in the spring of 2006 and ratified by them. The drafting committee then went back to work on a second draft. About half of the drafting committee came to Bloomington this past October, and we worked on this second draft for several weeks. And we're expecting to meet with the full committee to work on this draft again in Thailand in July. Now, at the same time, we've been working with the state constitution drafting committees of Shan, Karen, Chin, Kachin, and Kareni states. They're at various stages of development. Some of the state constitutions are quite polished. Others are really still working out the basic structures. Working with both the state and the federal drafters gives us a unique opportunity to educate each about the work of the other and to anticipate possible points of tension between the state and federal constitutions. When we return to Thailand in July, we'll be meeting with several of the state drafting committees individually, and also for the first time with all of the state constitution drafters to discuss the federal constitution and the way in which it impacts their work on the state constitutions. Now, you might be wondering, what is the point of writing a constitution when the people drafting it don't have control over the country and, in fact, have no idea about when they will have such control. There are several reasons for starting the constitutional process now. First, the constitution is a crucial element in building the foundation for trust and cooperation among the democracy groups from different ethnic backgrounds. As I suggested, the minority groups were hesitant to join forces with the Burman democracy groups without some assurance that democracy was not going to mean simple majority control. Moreover, starting the dialogue about possible bases for cooperation before the parties to that dialogue take power may create significantly greater opportunities for success than if they waited until later. At this stage, no one in the room yet wields the power of government. And so their positions can be more flexible, and the range of possibilities is probably wider than it will be later on. In addition, we have more time. Time to explore and educate and help people find their way to new perspectives. More time than we will have once the transition takes place. And if the participants can come to a stable compromise or build common ground now, then that foundation may actually help them through the more difficult and divisive times that no doubt lay ahead. Second, the Constitution helps to raise international support for the democracy movement, and it does this in two ways. First, this Constitution provides a striking contrast to the half-finished version being produced in the SPDC's internal convention. As I said, we don't have a final version, but uh, information does leak out from time to time about what it is they're up to. Um, and. Uh, Putting the two constitutions side by side uh, ought to convince the world about which side it's on. Um, second, the Constitution demonstrates that the democratic opposition has a concrete plan so that when the military government is finally displaced, Burma is less likely to fall into chaos.
Finally, the Constitution is a bargaining tool. The democracy movement has been calling for a tripartite dialogue between the SPDC, that's the military government, the NLD, that was the winning party in the 1990 elections, and the ethnic minority groups. If the international community can succeed in persuading the military government to engage in such a process of dialogue, then this constitution could function as a negotiating tool, setting the agenda for the bargaining that might follow. Now, let me admit, there is admittedly some tension between these three goals, right? One goal, the first goal, is to bring the groups together for a basis for cooperation and trust. The second goal is to motivate the international community to do something about the situation. And the third goal is to act as a negotiating tool. They're not always consistent. Um, and that tension does sometimes surface in the constitutional drafting process. For example, reassuring the international community may require more precision in constitutional language, while building consensus often requires a certain degree of ambiguity, as our own constitution amply demonstrates. The order in which I've listed the goals is the order of priority in which I believe they are held by the drafters of the constitution. So when there is tension, it is generally resolved in favor of building common ground or compromise as the primary goal among these three. All right, so now let me highlight for you a couple of issues in the drafting of this Constitution as examples of the process. First, I'll describe some of the many mechanisms in the Constitution designed to ensure a balance of power between the ethnic majority and various minority groups. And second, I'll highlight a couple of the mechanisms designed to promote greater gender equality. In each case, I'll tell you a little bit about what the present draft Constitution says, why certain choices were made, and which issues still remain to be decided. The balance of power between the majority and minority ethnic groups is addressed by the Constitution through two categories of mechanisms. First, there are constitutional arrangements that are designed to protect the influence of the minorities at the national level. And second, there are mechanisms designed to protect the autonomy of smaller geographical units in which most minority groups live. These categories correspond to the two types of rights that Will Kimlicka has described for minority groups, participation rights, participation in the national government, and autonomy rights. In the first category, the Constitution guarantees that the national government will include the views and influence of the ethnic minority groups. And this is how it does it. Um, there will be a bicameral legislature in which the upper house is like our own Senate, designed with equal representation for each state, regardless of population. This house is called the Chamber of Nationalities. Now, Burma is presently divided into seven states, which correspond more or less to the traditional regions occupied by the minority ethnic groups, and seven divisions. The divisions make up the central area, which is predominantly occupied by the majority group. The states in the draft constitution will include the seven ethnic regional areas as presently constituted, and will also include a certain number of states formed from the present divisions. The exact number of these other states is, as you might imagine, a matter of some contention. Uh, but it will almost certainly be more than one Burman state, but less than seven. Burman states. And the result is that the ethnic minority groups, which hold the states around the periphery, will have majority control in the Chamber of Nationalities. Um, the Chamber of Nationalities has a series of powers that will make this influence significant. First, and most importantly, all legislation has to pass both houses in order to become law. So they simply will have a veto power over legislation. Second, all bills related to the use or development of natural resources must originate in the Chamber of Nationalities. You might wonder where that's coming from. The military government has engaged in a fairly systematic plan of exploitation of the natural resources in the ethnic minority regions, um, vast destruction of the environment in some cases. And so they are particularly concerned to have control over that issue. Third, the Chamber of Nationalities elects the president from a list of candidates chosen by the state legislative assemblies. 
Okay? The state legislative assemblies make a list of candidates. The president is elected by the upper house of the legislature. Um, moreover, once someone from a particular state has served as president, no person from that state will be eligible to be president until three subsequent terms have elapsed. Now, the procedures for choosing the president need substantial work, but they serve at least two obvious goals. First, to ensure that the presidency can't be dominated by persons from any one state. And second, to ensure that the president is someone acceptable to at least most of the ethnic minority groups which will control the upper chamber. Now, the president, I should say, is not like our president in the US. The Burmese have chosen a parliamentary system in which a prime minister who is chosen by the lower house of the legislature will be the head of government. But the president in their constitution is more than just a figurehead. In addition to his or her symbolic role as head of state, the president is the commander in chief of the armed forces and exercises some real control over the deployment of the military. The president also will have some power to check the prime minister in other ways, for example, regarding the dissolution of parliament. So while the president is not the person directly responsible for the formulation or execution of government policy, the president is nonetheless significant. And the choice of the president will be largely controlled by the ethnic minority groups through both their state legislatures and the upper house of the national legislature. So both the structure of the legislature and the presidency are designed to ensure substantial influence for the ethnic minority populations at the national level. The second issue for these communities is autonomy over their own regional affairs. And it's the federal structure of the draft constitution that is designed to ensure a substantial degree of such autonomy. The states retain all powers not specifically delegated by the constitution, either exclusively or concurrently to the federal government. Moreover, the constitution as presently drafted includes an explicit right of self-determination for the states. Now the drafters, when they wrote self-determination, they didn't mean it in the sense of international law. They meant it as a kind of protection for state autonomy. And the committee is presently considering a modification of this provision that would strengthen that protection in two ways. First, the proposed provision would specify the particular powers that the drafters believe are most important for the states. That is, it would define this right of the states as including, for example, the power to control admission to state citizenship, the power to regulate the ownership of real property within the state, and the power to promote the traditional cultures and languages of the state. Second, the proposed provision would explicitly provide that the federal government may not exercise any of its exclusive or concurrent powers in a way that infringes on these specific powers of the state. In other words, in the area marked out by this provision for state autonomy, the normal assumption of the supremacy of federal law would be reversed. In that area, state law would be supreme. None of the states are themselves completely homogeneous. Um, in fact, many of them are very complex mixtures of different ethnic groups. And even where one group predominates, there are substantial minority populations. The drafters of the Constitution wish to protect these groups as well, not just at the level of the state, but at smaller levels. Um, and one of the provisions, which still needs a lot of work, uh, would allow ethnic minorities within a state to petition the state for the creation of an autonomous region or territory. Now, I have to tell you, it's very clear, uh, very unclear at this stage what rights or powers of self-government would come with designation as an autonomous region. It's also unclear what exact process will be used to make the decision about whether or not to create an autonomous region. And it's also unclear whether there are any standards that are supposed to be applied um, in making that, process, making that decision or whether it's strictly a political decision. Um, and finally, it's uncertain whether this provision is intended to create justiciable rights that could be the basis for a claim in court. Could someone sue the state legislature if they fail to designate an autonomous region. 
Um, we don't know yet. Um, we've just begun to talk about this issue, and I suspect that this is not going to be an easy one to resolve. Finally, we've worked closely with the drafters to try to ensure that these protections for ethnic minority group participation and autonomy don't generate even greater division and hardening of the boundaries between the groups. We have to deal with the legitimate fears and concerns of the groups that have suffered a very long history of oppression at the hands of the majority. But we've tried to deal with them in ways that promote the gradual softening of the lines of division. So for example, in the federal constitution, the states are defined not by ethnicity, but by geography allowing for their gradual disconnection from ethnic origins through natural movements of population. The present draft constitution actually describes two categories of states, those that are the traditional homelands for particular ethnic groups and those that are not. But these two categories of states have no constitutional function in this draft. Both sorts of states are treated exactly the same way under the constitution. We have suggested that the drafters drop this provision so as to eliminate the symbolic differentiation between the different sorts of states. The federal constitution also protects a series of individual rights that will limit the abilities of states to enforce ethnic or cultural homogeneity. First, the constitution protects the right of every citizen of the federal union to equality regardless of native birthplace, ethnicity, and native language along with all of the usual categories like race, gender, and so on. The Constitution also protects the individual's right to worship and practice his religion and to promote his culture, customs, and languages. And importantly, the Constitution protects the right of a citizen to travel anywhere in the Federal Union and to reside and work in any member state. Thus, there will continue to be movements of population from one state to another. And once there, the newcomers will be entitled to a series of rights protecting their own cultural and religious practices. In addition, we've been working with the state constitution drafting committees to reconsider some of their initial decisions regarding state citizenship. Some of these committees were inclined to define citizenship in ethnic terms for their states, or at least to make it easier for people of a certain ethnicity to claim or reclaim citizenship. We've pointed out the difficulties with this approach, beginning with the problems of identification, who counts as a member of the group, and moving on to the issues of permanently disenfranchised domestic populations. Um, and the state constitutions will, I believe, ultimately disconnect state citizenship from ethnicity sufficiently to allow for the gradually increasing homogeneity to broaden the identities of the states. Okay. Let me turn from ethnicity to gender. As I mentioned earlier, Burma has had two constitutions since independence, one written in 1947 and one in 1974. There were no women involved in the drafting of either of these documents. The present constitution does have women on the drafting committee. There are three representatives of the Women's League of Burma, which is an umbrella group that uh, sort of includes representation from all of the women's groups in the democracy movement. Unfortunately, though, none of the other groups which contributed members to the drafting committee, including all of the ethnically based groups, the NLD, Aung San Suu Kyi's party, and the government in exile, none of them included any women among their representatives. The lack of women in the constitutional process is, of course, quite consistent with the role of women in Burmese society more generally. While the international face of the Burma democracy movement is the face of a woman, Aung San Suu Kyi, women still hold very little of the power, either within Burma or in the exile community. Women's health, literacy, and economic status is systematically lower than men's, and the traditional gendered division of labor means that their family responsibilities make leadership positions difficult for them to hold. There is some variation among the different ethnic groups in terms of gender roles and women's representation, but all of the groups share the same basic problem of substantial underrepresentation. 
We've worked with the WLB, the Women's League of Burma's representatives, to craft particular language to address their concerns with the Constitution. And let me focus on just two of the mechanisms that they've proposed. First, they'd like to modify the basic equality guarantee in the Constitution in several ways. The present draft says, every person shall be equal before the law, irrespective of gender. And they would like to expand this article in five ways. First, they'd like the equality guarantee to explicitly adopt a substantive rather than a formal model of equality. So the focus will be on the impact of a law on gender hierarchy rather than on whether the law facially treats men and women the same or not. Second, they'd like to add certain additional categories to the bases on which discrimination is prohibited. These categories have a particularly damaging impact on women, but they're sometimes not included within the idea of gender equality, such as marital status and pregnancy. Their third goal is to explicitly authorize affirmative or positive action by the government to promote the equality of historically disadvantaged groups. And for this, they can borrow directly from the South African Constitution and the Canadian Constitution. Their fourth goal is to allow for the possibility of horizontal application of the equality right to private forms of discrimination where that's appropriate. In other words, equality would be guaranteed not just against government action, but also against action by private parties. Um, again, we've borrowed the application provision from the South African Constitution with some minor modifications to allow courts to apply the constitutional equality provision to private actors in some circumstances. And their fifth goal is to include language creating a positive right to gender equality and a corresponding duty on government to promote equality in all spheres of life. This provision, in other words, would not merely allow affirmative action if the government chooses it. It would require affirmative action in certain circumstances. It would operate on the model of international human rights instruments, such as CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which, by the way, Burma has signed. The second major proposal that the WLB has made for modifying the Constitution concerns a quota for women in decision-making positions. They would like a 30% minimum quota for women in both houses of the legislature. Ideally, they would also like a similar quota for appointed offices in the executive branch and the judiciary. The rest of the committee has tentatively agreed to the legislative quota, but not yet to the other parts. Um, and by the way, a quota for women in the legislature uh, is something Americans, I think, really only began to hear about with respect to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we may, for that reason, think that it's a strange and unusual creature. But in fact, over 40 countries now require gender quotas of one form or another, either in their constitutions or their laws. And another 50 voluntarily impose quotas, the political parties voluntarily impose quotas um, on their candidate lists. The language proposed by the WLB for the legislative quota leaves the precise design of the quota mechanism to the legislative body that is responsible for designing the electoral laws. This flexibility is necessary because the quota has to be carefully designed to fit the particular electoral system or else it will be useless. For the Chamber of People's Representatives, which is the lower house of the legislature, that election law will be created by the house itself along with a federal election commission. For the Chamber of Nationalities, the upper house of the legislature, the election law for each state's delegation will be created by the state legislature. So what the federal constitution does is simply require that the responsible bodies must design the laws and regulations so as to ensure that a minimum of 30% of the representatives will be women, and a minimum of 30% will be men. The quota is framed in gender neutral terms so as to make it clear that it is not an affirmative action program designed to benefit the particular women who receive seats under it. The quota is instead understood as a distribution requirement necessary to assure democratic representation. That's why the quota requires a minimum of each gender. And that's why it's not conceived as a temporary measure but rather as a permanent constitutional requirement. 
If at any point in the future the electoral system fails to generate a legislature with at least this level of representation for each gender, then the Constitution would require the electoral laws to be changed. Ah, hmm. Okay, let me try quickly to tell you a little bit about our work in Liberia. Um, our connection here is much more recent. We went to Liberia in December of 2005, shortly after the historic election that made Ellen Johnson Sirleaf the first elected woman head of state in Africa. In fact, we arrived at the Monrovia airport only hours after George Weah, who was the losing candidate in the presidential <coughs> runoff election, had had a press conference at the airport in which he announced that he was the president of Liberia. Um, and uh, as a result, our hosts had to drive us for several hours around the periphery of the city to get to our hotel because of the rioting in downtown Monrovia by we as supporters. Um, Liberia is a country of about three and a half million people located on the west coast of Africa. It was founded by freed slaves from the US who are called Americo-Liberians. And they gradually subdued and eventually incorporated the indigenous population of the area. Uh, but the small group of Americo-Liberians, they're, they're no more than 5% of the population, controlled everything in Liberia. Social unrest led to a coup in 1980 by Samuel Doe, who was a master sergeant in the Liberian army and an indigenous Liberian. He ruled for about a decade, plundering the country and uh, massively violating the civil rights of the population. In 1989, Charles Taylor launched a rebellion against Doe's regime, and that led to a prolonged civil war. There was a brief hiatus in 1997 when Taylor was elected president, but fighting resumed in 2000. Um, and then in 2003, all of the warring factions agreed to a peace accord under which Taylor stepped down from power, an interim government was formed, and elections were to be held. And those elections took place in October of 2005. It's really difficult to imagine the devastation wrought in Liberia by their civil war. The physical destruction alone is staggering. Approximately one-tenth of the population was killed in the civil war. And many, many more people were raped or tortured or lost their homes. The capital city of Monrovia was destroyed. Uh, it still has no electrical power system, no running water system. Every few buildings, you know, every third building on the streets is a bombed out shell. The streets themselves are filled with rubble and also with trash and refuse. Um, but the physical destruction is only the tip of the iceberg because the social, cultural, and emotional destruction is much harder to describe. Whole villages were destroyed, creating enormous populations of internally displaced persons, many of whom flooded into the capital city, some of whom live in refugee camps now around the borders, um, some of whom are in other countries, and some of whom are now returning. Um, the people who lived through the Civil War suffered amazing rates of rape and torture. Hundreds of thousands of children were made orphans. Many of them became child soldiers. Some of those child soldiers were themselves the victims of atrocities. Some of them were the perpetrators of atrocities. Some of them were both. A whole generation of children grew up in Liberia with no formal education because the schools were unable to operate during much of the Civil War. They grew up without parents and without other sorts of authority figures. They grew out up with no social structures to depend on at all. Uh, I suspect that the breakdown of these cultural and social structures constitutes um, the sort of meta problem that Professor Horowitz described in South Africa in a slightly different context. Um, and it means that the challenges facing the government are absolutely enormous. Liberia's legal system <clears throat> is based on our own. And their current constitution, which was written in 1986, is very similar to ours. President Johnson Sirleaf has said that she is interested in reforming the constitution. And when we met with her, we discussed the center's involvement in that process. There's presently a bill before the Liberian legislature that would establish a law reform commission 
to consider and propose changes to the law at both the statutory and constitutional levels. And the expectation here seems to be that the change will happen piecemeal rather than through a full-blown redrafting of the Constitution. Now, as the first step, in this process of constitutional reevaluation, the center is working with Liberian legal scholars to produce the first commentary on the existing constitution. No such work exists or ever has existed. Liberian law students, Liberia has the oldest law school in West Africa, and Liberian law students learn their con law from American con law casebooks um, because there are no casebooks. Uh, for Liberian constitutional law. The judges and lawyers in Liberia have no treatise that they can look to to help them interpret their own constitution. Uh, when we met with the Liberian Supreme Court, they specifically asked us to work on a commentary on the present constitution. And that work is now substantially underway. Uh, our hope is ultimately to produce three versions of this commentary. The first will be for lawyers and judges, very detailed. The second, somewhat shorter, will be for other government officials and civil society leaders. And the third, in simplest and shortest form, will be for the general public to educate them about their present constitution, which is, of course, a necessary foundation for considering any proposed changes in that constitution. Uh, once the constitutional reform process begins, there are several issues that will certainly be considered by Liberians. And all of these issues concern over-concentrations of power that are either required or allowed by the current Constitution. Reducing these over-concentrations of power could help Liberians not only to repair the damage of the Civil War, but also to avoid the frustrations and exclusions that led to the breakdown of order in the first place. In Liberia, power is over-concentrated in four ways. First, in the president, as opposed to the other branches of government. Second, in the central government in Monrovia, rather than in the hinterlands. Third, in Americo-Liberians, rather than in indigenous people. And fourth, in men, rather than in women. All of these over-concentrations are exacerbated by the lack of adequate protection for freedom of speech. Because, of course, that means that the people excluded are not able to make their voices heard to protest their exclusion. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to run through the specific ways in which the Constitution overconcentrates power in these four ways, but I'd certainly be happy to talk about that at the end if you're interested. Um, let me simply turn to a very brief conclusion. Um, just let me say a word about the experience of working with people from these countries. When I look around the table at the Burmese Federal Constitution Drafting Committee, for example, every single person in that room has lost his or her home and family. Many of them have suffered imprisonment or torture because they wanted democracy and freedom for their country. In both Burma and Liberia, I have met truly remarkable people. Some of them are great leaders with a generosity of spirit and a capacity for growth that I deeply admire. And all of them have a level of dedication and courage that's inspiring. After 20 years of teaching and writing about American constitutional law, I think, I'm afraid, I had become a bit disillusioned. I no longer had a lot of faith in the power of the fundamental ideals of democratic constitutionalism. In America, I believe we take these ideals for granted. And they seem to have lost much of the power to move us or to guide our politics. But working with the Burmese and the Liberians has renewed my faith. Many of these people have been through horrors that most of us are lucky enough to find unimaginable. But rather than despair, they are filled with hope and with determination, and it's sustained by these ideals. So I'm grateful to them not only for the opportunity to be a part of these exciting projects, but also for having made me remember why I thought constitutional law mattered enough to be a life's work.
Thank you for inviting me. Professor Williams is uh, willing to take questions. We have about 10 minutes uh, for questions. So I am, but I think I'm going to sit down if that's okay. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, I actually have two questions. The first, uh, both about uh, Burma, though. The first, regarding the upper house, are there any, are there any guidelines uh, provided by the federal constitution in terms of how the states elect their representatives, even term limits, length of term? Yes. Um, there are definitely term limits, or rather, length of term. Now, not term limits in the sense of a limited number of terms. Um, but uh, the upper house, at the moment, is uh, designed for a six-year term. Um, and, um, and there is a set number in the Constitution, although there is some argument over whether it needs to be uh, adapted. But there's a, there will be a certain number of representatives from each state, probably six from each state in the upper house. Um, but that's it. Uh, and that leaves the states a great deal of flexibility. They could elect all six at large over the whole state. They could design electoral districts and elect one or two or however many from each district. They could create um, various sorts of requirements for the position. There are requirements in the Constitution about age, residency, and so on. But that's all. Um, yeah. And my second question was, in regards to the lower house and the the prime minister and his ministers, are there any requirements there for the different um, ethnicities in mm -hmm. terms of belonging to the cabinet being appointed there? Or is it just a kind of implicit uh, <coughs> assumption that in forming coalitions, they will kind of make up a, a, a variety and a representative group? That's a really good question. At the moment, there are not um, any distributional requirements for that. Um, and uh, I think that is something that we should be thinking about at least considering possibilities. Because the way the Constitution is seen by the Burmese drafters at the moment, the lower house belongs to the majority. Um, now, the majority may not always be simply Burman. It may not always be simply the majority ethnic group. But whatever the majority is, the lower house belongs to them. Um, and the upper house is specifically designed to protect ethnic minority groups. Um, but I, I'm not sure that's a good idea to divide it in quite that way. Yeah. Uh, my question deals with Burma. <clears throat> the first part deals with um, how the, I guess, the constitutional formation has gotten the I guess the military group to sort of buy into this uh, this structure, and the second part is what um, constitutional protections are in the constitution to prevent like another military coup. Good. Um, on the first answer, on the first question, the answer is the military government has not bought into this. The military government is running its own constitutional convention. It rejects the democracy group's efforts uh, to do a parallel constitution. Um, it rejects uh, still um, any possibility of a dialogue outside of its own convention. Um, so they're no part of this at all. Um, and the democracy groups are counting on the international community <coughs> to bring pressure to bear on the military government so that at some point in the future, they may be able to sit down with them with this constitution in hand. Um, uh, your second question was protections in the Constitution. There's a lot of interest about how the military will be structured in the new Constitution. Um, one of the guarantees is that it will be limited to a certain percentage of the population, a much smaller percentage than it is now. It will have to be much smaller. Secondly, there will be distribution requirements. The military will have to reflect the ethnic mix of the nation, not by ethnicity, but by state, again. The states are being used as proxies here for ethnicity. And until and unless populations shift, they're pretty good proxies. Um, so that will uh, hopefully avoid the domination of the military um, by the ethnic majority group. Lastly, there's a very clear chain of command in the Constitution um, that ties the military to civilian command. Um, and well, no, I shouldn't say lastly. Lastly, after that, um, there are a series of constitutional rights um, guaranteeing uh, freedom from imprisonment, freedom from torture, freedom from um, you know, extrajudicial killings, and so on, um, the sorts of things the military is engaged in. Now, obviously, you have to have a court system 
with the power and the independence to enforce those rights. Um, and creating such a thing will not be easy in Burma, where the courts for 40 years have been um, under the thumb of the military. Uh, someone told us a funny story. They said, being a judge in Burma is the easiest job in the world. All you have to know how to do is answer the phone. Um, OK, yeah. What are the incentives for the minorities to stay together in the one country? Why, um, why not split? Um, there have been states that were um, hard to convince uh, that they wanted to join. Um, the Arakan uh, state in particular, um, for a long time, uh, insisted that it was not part of Burma and did not want to be part of Burma. Um, but all of them have now agreed to be part of the nation. And the reason is they really are not economically viable on their own. Um, uh, almost none of them would be. Um, almost all of them could benefit from their connections to each other in a well-functioning democratic system. They're obviously not benefiting very much right now. Um, but they project that their futures would be better if they face them together than if they face them alone. It's a practical judgment. Yeah. Um, I know you spoke about um, allowing minority um, populations to petition for independence. So how does that kind of, or does it undermine the, the integration that you're trying to accomplish there? Uh, it's, it's a really difficult situation. And as I suggested, that's one part of the Constitution that is really in the very early stages. Um, the idea here would not be independence as in an independent nation. It would be an autonomous region. Now, what exactly that means, no one has yet said. Okay? Um, but it certainly would not mean independence at the level of making their own foreign policy, for example. Um, it would mean control over their internal affairs uh, that is presumably greater than they would have simply being a subunit of a state. Okay? Um, and Beyond that, I can't tell you too much about the specifics because I just I don't know yet. Um, but I don't think it would threaten the unity of the country as a whole in the way they are envisioning it. It might well, though, threaten the gradual disconnection between government structure and ethnicity, um, which is, I think, one of the goals, but a very long-term goal. Can you speak a little bit about how the Constitution um, would restructure the ju judiciary? In Burma? Yeah. Um, the, one of the big issues for Burma is that it's going to be a federal system. So there will be both state and federal judiciaries. And of course, we're working on both kinds of constitutions. The federal constitution, and this actually is, I should say, federalism is extremely mysterious to people elsewhere in the world. You know, it's not actually a very common thing. Um, and they don't understand how it's supposed to work, um, and especially with respect to the judiciary. Um, so we have a, a federal judge, David Hamilton, who is on our board um, and who is helping us to advise the Burmese about what a federal judiciary would look like. They envision it as having a constitutional court um, and a Supreme Court and some number of lower federal courts to be determined by the assembly, the legislature. So similar to our structure except for the separation between the constitutional and Supreme Court. Um, they have specified the jurisdiction of these courts, but in ways that I think is fundamentally unworkable because they don't have a clear sense of what a federal judiciary is like. Um, so that's going to need to be rewritten, um, and they're working on that now. Um, the real issue is independence rather than how many courts and at what levels. Um, and some of that is constitutional. There will be constitutional protections for judges' tenures. They will have to be removed through a constitutionally mandated process. There will be protection for their salaries. Those are constitutional mechanisms for assuring independence. But a great deal of judicial independence is cultural rather than constitutional. Um, and there are, in fact, very interesting issues in both Burma and Liberia about how the process of writing or rewriting a constitution might contribute to the culture that's necessary to sustain that document in the long term. <laughs>
yeah, the way the upper house is conceived or has been conceived in Burma seems to, I think, almost in my mind, guarantee that you'll have a president who is an ethnic minority. Uh, why, why would that be something that is acceptable even, even among the uh, NLD who, who, you know, who would represent the majority population in yeah. Burma? I, I think actually if this constitution were to come into effect sometime in the very near future, most people anticipate that the first president would be Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, who is an ethnic Burman, um, uh, but is a figure that everyone in the country could agree on as the symbol, um, the symbolic um, head of state. Um, but I think you're right. In the long run, the president will very likely be uh, from the ethnic minority groups. The Burmans are agreeing to this because, first of all, they will control probably the lower house. Okay. Um, therefore, they will appoint the prime minister. And the prime minister is the head of government. The prime minister exercises most of the day-to-day -day power. Okay. Um, the president is a check on the prime minister. He really has relatively little inherent power. Mostly what he has the power to do is stop the prime minister from doing things. Okay. Um, and the Burmans are agreeing to that because they know that if they don't, they will have another civil war on their hands. The reason the, Burman, the reason that Burma fell from democracy to start with is because even in a democratic system, the ethnic majority began to act in ways that the minority groups felt were oppressive, and they began to fight. Um, so the stability of their country, they know, depends on this. How do you see, foresee the international community persuading the SPDC to actually engage in talks with the dem democracy movement, especially because the SPDC really seemingly has nothing to gain from engaging in those talks, and also because it has pretty much isolated Burma economically and politically from most of the rest of the world, and the countries that it actually does talk to don't have the best history with democracy or even stable government? That's right. Um, this is. Uh Everybody in the democracy movement has their own favorite scenario for how this is going to come about. I don't think there is any consensus. Um, let me start with that. Um, it is very hard to imagine the military government voluntarily sitting down to negotiate with the democracy movement. Um, I think the hope right now is that China and India um, may be key. And you're right, China, I'm sure that's who you were thinking of when you said that they don't have a very good record. Um, uh, they, they're not particularly interested in democracy in Burma, of course, but what they are interested in is stability in Burma. Um, China is having a number of problems because of Burma. There's a huge flow of HIV and drugs across the border um, from Burma to China. And China is not happy about that, and the Burmese government is incapable of stopping it. Um, moreover, China doesn't want to see another revolution in Burma. That is, they don't want to see sort of uh, rampant anarchy. There is anarchy in border regions, but they don't want it to overtake the whole country. Um, and lastly, Burma has become such a pariah state in the international community, it's not clear that China wants to spend its moral capital defending Burma. Um, it's got costs for China's standing. Um, and it's not clear what it's getting back for those costs. So there is some hope that in the long run, China might be persuaded to put pressure on them. And India, of course, has much clearer interests in doing so. Uh, the argument on the other side for India, unfortunately, is economic. They have a lot of ties, economic ties, to the military government. Well, thank you very much for this really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.